Welcome to Ministry Online Training Center. Uh, please, uh, let's open up in prayer. Father, I submit myself to you and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It is my desire and hope that I speak the word with clarity, simplicity, and accuracy so the truth of your word will go forth and be sown in the hearts of the hearer. Because of your desire that our soul prospers, I confidently expect this to happen because I believe your love for me and for those that are submitting their whole heart to your word. Amen. Hi, I'm Jackie Stewart, and I will be your instructor for this hour on Applied Righteousness. Turn to or take note of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which reads in the, New, in the King James Version of the Bible, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And as a clarification, let me read that again. And it is saying, all scripture is profitable for what you believe. To show where you are wrong. To show you how to make what it is wrong and make it right. And to show you or inform you how you are to live in a way deemed right by God. There is a law of righteousness. And it is the absolute conformity with divine will in purpose, thought, and action of the Lord. This compliance with the will of God must be full and complete and performed exactly to the law. God's word is law. And um, take note of Psalms chapter 119, one, verse 142, and it reads, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. And it's speaking of the righteousness of God. And this is something that you want to take note of, that righteousness is not about conduct. It is a gift from God to us through Jesus. Righteousness is not about your being. Excuse me. Righteousness is about your being and not about your doing. So let me repeat that again. Righteousness is not about conduct. It is a gift from God to us through Jesus. Righteousness is about your being and not your doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 reads in the King James, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And how do you become a new creature in Christ Jesus? By professing Jesus as Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead and believing with your heart, from your heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, it reads, And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So God is the one that is initiating the reconciliation. He's basing it on your being in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians verse 19, Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19 reads to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in God's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. So you are not ambassadors because you act like an ambassador. You are an ambassador because you are in Christ Jesus. And um, in verse 21 of that same chapter of 2 Corinthians, For he, God, has made him Jesus to be sin for us. So did Jesus commit any sin? 
No, Jesus was made sin, who knew no sin, that we, and who is the we? Any man that is in Christ. So let's read that. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, any man in Christ, might be made the righteousness of God in him. So those of us that are in Christ Jesus as a result of our, of our professing him as our Lord and Savior, we have been made righteous. It's nothing that we did or didn't do to make us righteous. We have been made righteous as a result of what Jesus did, not of what we are doing or not doing. And let me read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 in several versions of the Bible. The first is in the um, ERV, and so let me make sure I have that, what that is. The ERV, I'm looking right now um, on the free Bible, it's called ESORT, that um, you will find when you go to our website. And the ERV is the easy to read version of the Bible. I have it in the CEV, which is a contemporary English version of the Bible. And then I have it in the DRB, which is the 1899 Douay Reims Bible. So as a teacher of God's Word and as a student of God's Word, it's very helpful to have scriptures um, studied in the various versions of the Bible. So let's see, in the ERV it says, Christ had no sin, but God made him become sin so that in Christ we could be right with God. In the CEV it reads, Christ never sinned, but God treated him as a sinner so that Christ could make us acceptable to God. So we are acceptable to God as a result of what Jesus has done. And in the DRB it reads, Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, he hath made sin, he hath made sin for us, that we might be made the justice of God in him. Sin for us, that is, to be a sin offering, a victim for sin. So you see then it is by the grace of God that we have been made righteous. Grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. We didn't deserve to be made, be made righteous, but we were made righteous as a result of what Jesus did at the cross. When you know, understand, believe, and act on what you believe, the Holy Spirit will change what you do to agree with what you have been made to be. So remember, our premise is that you are not Righteousness is not about your doing, it is about your being. It is what you have been made. You have been made the righteousness of Christ in Christ Jesus. What else have you been made? Check out 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. You are not what man was prior to your receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And just as a preview, prior to being made a man in Christ Jesus, you and I were a no people. And we will go to scriptures to substantiate that. In um, verse 18, you've been made a minister of peace. Not because you've done anything or, or um, anything peaceful or become peaceful, is because you've been made a minister of peace. In verse 19 it says, you are a preacher of the news of peace. And then in verse 20 it says that you are an ambassador for Christ. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You have been made an heir of God in Christ Jesus. So now what you and I want to do is to learn how does a new creature think? What does a minister of peace do? How do you preach the news of peace? How does an ambassador act? What are the duties of an ambassador? What are the privileges of an ambassador? What are the rewards of an ambassador? And in verse um, 21 it says, you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So how does a, per a righteous person think? 
you have been made righteous now you want to be righteous in your act in your thinking and in 2nd Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 it gives us a solution and it says and all of us as with unveiled faces because we continue to behold in the Word of God as a mirror the glory of the Lord so we see then that the Word of God is a mirror we look into the Word of God to see who we are and what we have in Christ Jesus and what we can do in Christ Jesus so we look into the mirror of the Word and we are constantly being transfigured into his very own image the image of the Son of God in ever increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit and uh, going back up to verse 17 I want to just uh, stick this explanation in it says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the key word here is are become new. So with ad in infinitum, we are becoming new every single minute, every single day. In the Second Corinthians, uh, going back to uh, Second Corinthians 3.18, in the Message Bible, this is another version of the Bible, it says, all of us. And who are the us? Those that are in Christ Jesus nothing between us and God our face is shining with the brightness of his face and so we are transfigured much like the Messiah our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him so God enters our lives as we allow him to enter into our lives he's not going to coerce us into doing anything it is his exhortation his prompting for us to study the Word of God, to rightly um, discern the Word of God, so that then we could have a precise and correct knowledge of God and of His Son, because as a result of that, peace and grace is multiplied in our lives, because we become more peaceful, have more thoughts of peace, because we know we can rely and trust on the Lord. With the born again experience, and we see that uh, born again experience uh, example in John chapter 3 verse 1 and uh, I'll read it to you it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus and he was a ruler of the Jews and he was speaking to Jesus and um, Jesus says verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God and so we will see then why is it necessary for man to be born again? As a result of being born again, we can see in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Turn there please, or take note, take down notes. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned for be beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. So there is a path that we are to um, take, and it is the word of God that will lead us through this path. and. Um, we are to follow the Word of God. It says the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So we want to get this Word of God in us to such a degree that out of the abundance of our heart we will speak the Word, we will recognize the Word, and we will follow the Word on, these, on this prearranged path. In Christ you have been recreated or made in the image and likeness of God as a result of being born again like the first Adam. So we see from these scriptures something happened to the first Adam who was made in the image and likeness of God. Something happened to him. So what we want to learn and, and to understand correctly is why was it necessary for a man to be born again and what happened to the first man Adam. The glory of the Lord that the first Adam wore before his disobedience appears in all born-again people or Christians as in a glass 
The Lord is the projector of the glory. All Christians reflect as mirrors his glory. So that's why the scripture tells us that don't take the glory for yourself or the credit for yourself. Anything that is good and, and profitable is of the Lord. Speaking about the um, reflection that you and I are in Christ Jesus, this is from Albert Barnes' um, commentary. And it says, so to speak, the glorious perfections of God shone from heaven, beamed upon the gospel. The good news of the gospel is known as the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved. It is a gift of God. You cannot earn your salvation. You and I cannot save ourselves. So let me begin again. So to speak, the glorious perfections of God shone from heaven, beamed upon the gospel, and were thence reflected to the eye and the heart of the Christian, and had the effect, what had the effect? The gospel, of transforming them into the same image of Jesus Christ. We are changed into his very image by the continued succession of glory as it were streaming upon us from the Lord. So the more word we have in our heart, the more faith we will have for the word. And the faith is acting on what it is that you believe. And if you change what you believe, you will change what you do. There is a term in psychology and it's called a gestalt. And it is an emotional disturbance which disturbs the mental picture you have of yourself versus what you are experiencing. And as an example of that, if you and I were to purchase a brand new car and we're very proud of our car and we park our car and go inside a restaurant and we come back out and there's a dent or a scratch on our car, this is going to disturb us because the view that we have in our imagination of our car was one without a scratch. So this creates a gestalt. You have a picture in your mind of your perfectly pristine car and now you go outside and you see that the car is not the same car that you have in your imagination. So biblically speaking, um, a gestalt would be where you and I have in our imagination one, one way that we see ourselves. We see ourselves possibly as unrighteous we are, now this is the person that is in Christ Jesus. We see ourselves as unrighteous. We see ourselves as sinners. We see ourselves as something that is negative. When God says that you are an ambassador for Christ, when God says that you have a ministry of reconciliation, now you and I may know this intellectually and what you and I want to do is get as much information about applying our righteousness to becoming uh, in action and in thought that ambassador for Christ, that new creature in Christ Jesus. So if we see in the word of God that we are an ambassador for Christ, that we're ministers of peace, preachers of the news of peace, that we're ambassadors, that we're righteousness, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but we don't believe that, it's just an intellectual belief, then this should create a gestalt in our minds and we then will turn to the word so that we can then learn how to apply righteousness to our lives. And remember, righteousness is a gift. We have been made righteous. So uh, it is a law of our nature that we are molded in our moral feelings by the persons with whom we associate and by the objects which we contemplate. There's a saying that some of you may have heard that birds of a feather flock together. So whatever we put our attention to long enough, then we will turn into that which we have um, placed our attention on. And so the question I want to ask you and, and myself is, what are we contemplating? What are we conscious of? Are we conscious of sin? And the question I ask of you, how much of our sin has been forgiven? Correct, all of our sins. Past, current and future sins. God says for his sake he will remember our sins no more. Why? Because all of our sin was placed on Jesus who knew no sin. He was made sin for us and we were made 
righteous. So there was a divine exchange. So what are you conscious of? Sin, are you conscious of your righteousness? That you have the ability to go boldly to the throne of grace in a time of need without any sense of inferiority or fear. So that is because you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not because you're doing anything righteous, not because um, you're uh, not doing anything sinning, but you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So now what are you conscious of? Are you conscious of the sentence of condemnation or are you conscious of the approval that God has for you? Not because of anything you've done or not done, but because of Jesus who received all of the condemnation um, for our sin, the sentence for our sin, the wages of sin is death. Jesus received that sin. He died. He died for the sin of how much? Of the Christians? No, he died for the sin of the world. And we receive approval as a result of what Jesus did did by dying on the cross, shedding his blood, receiving the whips, the stripes of the whip upon his back, dying, shedding his blood, and being raised again. So we want to be aware of God's approval for us, not because of what we've done or not done, but because of Jesus. It is called the grace of God, unmerited, unearned, undeserved approval unearned, undeserved righteousness. What are we conscious of? Penalty or reward. All of the penalty for our sin was placed on Jesus. There was a divine exchange. He received all the penalty and we received all of the reward, all of the promises of God, which are yes and in him, amen. What are you conscious of? The curses or the blessings? And so by now you should know that the curses for our sins, all of them, all of those curses that we find in Deuteronomy 28 and the other places that have curses, all of those curses were placed on Jesus. And so we now then can access the blessings. By contemplating the respellent face of the blessed Redeemer, we are changed into something of the same image. In Romans um, chapter 8, verse 29, it says, as we look at, in other words, that statement is, as we look upon Jesus, as we put our attention upon Jesus, as we put our attention on righteousness and approval and reward and blessings, we then will not only um, have a will to believe, we will believe and act on that believing that we are righteous, that we have the approval of God, that we can access the reward of God, that we're that we can uh, access, uh, access the blessings of God, receive them. God is not running behind us. He's already arranged for righteousness, approval, reward, and blessings prior to you and I doing anything good or evil. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it reads, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. So this is telling us that we are to be conformed to the image of God. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. And there's a scripture, uh, I think it's 1 John 4, 17. And that reads, uh, that's 1 John 4, 17, speaking about being conformed to the image of Christ. It says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is speaking of Jesus so are we in this world so we're in so we are in this world as the same as Jesus we have been conformed to his image not because of anything we've done but because of what Jesus has done the the reward the approval that he has received from God for his sacrifice and so we are as Jesus is, but now we want to do the things that he's done and the scripture tells us as a result of who we are, we can do greater things. Not necessarily um, 
in quality, but in quantity, because we have access to all of these electronic devices so where you can be in your um, living room and evangelizing in other countries. And Jesus stayed around a certain area, plus there was only one of him in Jesus' name. All right. Remember, this is a key phrase. If you do not know who Jesus is, you cannot know who you are. And that's why we're told that to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the stuff that you want will be added to you. The material things will be added unto you. So your identity is determined by what your identity is not. Keyword. Your identity is not determined by what you do, but by what Jesus has already done. Our identity is in Jesus, so I want you to remember that. It is because of Jesus that we have access to the promises of God. And it's because of Jesus we can go boldly to the throne of grace. And it's because of Jesus we will have everlasting life with the Father. Remember, it is the Holy Spirit alone that the heart is changed and purified. So you and I don't have to work up anything. The work we are to do is to believe in God and be believe that God is good. And that in and itself is enough for you and I to contemplate on doing and to do is to believe God. That is the work we are to do. We assimilate to those with whom we have contact and to the objects with which we are familiar. So you and I are constantly changed into the same image. This scripture that tells us, and I'm sure it's familiar to you, that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is acting on what you believe. Whatever you hear over and over and over and over again, it's not having heard. What you continuously hear, you will have faith for, and faith is acting on what you believe. So you and I then need not work up any energy to have faith for something. What you and I want to do is to be seekers of truth, to hear the truth. So we assimilate to those with whom we have contact and to the objects with which we are familiar. You and I are constantly changed into the same image. and. Um, since some of this uh, material is that we're about to cover now is familiar, is because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In reviewing uh, my presentation, uh, previous pre presentations of applied righteousness, I noted that I had for uh, a number of uh, lessons uh, taught on Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3 from different vantage points. but. If you're following closely, you will say, well, continuously, um, or it's going to Genesis 1. And um, since I hope to verify the things that I'm led of the Holy Spirit to do, I'd like to um, do an explanation as to why um, the Holy Spirit led me to continuously study Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and Genesis 3, chapters 1, 2, and 3. And that's because you and I, we want to get an understanding. What is this all about? How is this occurring? What happened in the beginning? And what put us in this um, state that requires us to be recreated in Christ Jesus or be recreated? In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9, and we're speaking about establishing the fact that um, sometimes you will be led by the Holy Spirit to continuously go over uh, scriptures and over uh, principles and doctrine and then the reason we do that we think that the first time you teach something everybody doesn't hear um, what you are saying possibly they may be distracted sometimes the Holy Spirit starts speaking to them in their spirit and so they or they may be thinking about the, the dinner that they have uh, cooking at home. So you want to continuously, as that of the Holy Spirit, to go over material. 
because you you don't want to somebody said well I once heard that you want the student to understand it and be able to explain it and to eventually teach it to others using their personality using their vocabulary so the reason um, I personally have gone over Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. We find an, an explanation in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. And the question is, who shall teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The Word of God uh, is referred to in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 5, is referred to as milk and then it's also referred to as strong meat. So when we first come into the body of Christ, in our study we may start off with milk. The, and this is necessary if we are to build upon that. A person can have um, photographic memory. A person can read through the Bible, but it's not reading through the Bible or remembering things. It's being able to have precise, correct knowledge, to be able to understand, being able to discern good from evil, because there are stories in, uh, there are accounts in uh, scripture which tells us very clearly what, it, what happens when one does one thing and what happens when one chooses the blessing over the curses. And so it says, you learn line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And once you get into the Word of God, at some point you will just see that G the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, they're saying the same thing over and over again, but in different ways and in different places. So in the basic Bible English version of uh, Isaiah 28, 9, it says, to whom will he give knowledge? And to whom will he make clear the word? Will it be to those who have newly given up milk and who have only been taken from the breast? This is a babe in Christ, not speaking of your um, chronological age, but in your knowledge of the word of God. And verse 10 says, for it is one rule after another, one line after another, here a little, there a little. So that's how we learn. Here, here, here's a little and there's a little and knowledge growth understanding growth and wisdom growth comes from revelation by the word of God so I call it an aha moment aha I see we're not speaking with our physical eyes we're thinking with the eyes of our understanding oh now I understand and that's what is essential for you as a child of God and especially for you that are going to be teaching the word of God you and I don't have all the answers, so I'm not saying that. But the study that you do, that you do um, participate in, you want to have a be rooted and grounded in it as much as possible through study and diligently seeking truth. And then the second um, witness is found in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and then it says, "So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God." Faith or acting what you believe comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. So what you and I want to do is hear the word of God. We want to have faith for the word of God. You might, be, you and I may be looking at a television and we might have faith after hearing and hearing and hearing for the word of the commercial. So the scripture tells us be careful how you hear. I'm not saying don't look at commercials, but that was just an example. Faith comes by what you continuously hear, not having heard, but what you continuously hear. And with that result will be that you will act on it. And in the uh, ASV version of the Bible, uh, it reads, So belief cometh of hearing, and of hearing by the word of Christ. This is from a, a commentary, uh, precept upon precept on Genesis 1. And it was written by K. Arthur, Sheila Richardson, and Kurt, Dr. Kurt Wise. And as a, a student of God's Word and as, and as a teacher of God's Word, you may use commentaries. Um, and in this uh, version of, uh, in, in Esword, this um, teaching book, 
It has over, it appears to be um, seven or more um, commentators that you can go to and they will comment on the scriptures that you want to have expanded and explained to you. So this one is a commentary um, on Genesis 1 through 5. And it says, some may tell you it doesn't matter how God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Rather, it is simply important to know that he did. Well, that's not what I'm saying. That is an accurate statement. And what you and I want to uh, learn is the, well, the what, the why, the where, the who, the when of scripture so that you can, you can have a full knowledge of who, it, who is it that the writer of the scripture is speaking to. Is he speaking to Israel? Is he speaking to Gentiles? Is he speaking to Christians? And so once we get that down, then we can have a deeper understanding and knowledge of what's going on. So that was one reason um, the Holy Spirit led me to um, teach on and study on Genesis. Uh, this is what the psalmist speaks of creation. Uh, great works are the Lord, and we see in Psalms 111, verse 2, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. So we are to have pleasure in seeking out what the Bible says about creation and not the theory of mankind. While it is true that recognizing God as creator is more important than the details of creation, and other texts lay before us the joy of studying, of seeking out the magnitude and power of our Father's creation. As we contemplate what he has made, as we attempt to think God's thoughts after him, we begin to grasp what an amazing God we have as Lord and Father, and our confidence and security in him is only strengthened. So that's a quote from the commentary. And I want to exhort you, if you um, use comment a commentary from uh, uh, your source and you um, quote it verbatim, then you want to give credit for it. And you can use commentaries and changing the wording around and, and putting your own explanation in it as long as you're substantiating that um, uh, change by God's word then uh, you need not give credit to whoever it is that you are um, getting um, deeper revelation from. So let's look at the beginning again. So in Genesis 1 is speaking about God and the what of what it is that he's speaking about is um, it was with deliberate purpose that God created man. Adam was the first head of the species of man. Man finds himself to be constituted Lord of the earth, next in rank under the creator of all, formed in the image of his maker. And when you uh, see man, underline man, and then um, using various sources like the um, word study or strongs, then you can find out what Adam is there talk, are they talking about? Are they talking about the species of man or are they speaking of the male man? So the man that was formed in the image and likeness of his maker, that's another key, key phrase. So man was created in the image and likeness of God. God the Father, God the um, Son, God the Holy Spirit. This man was given rule and reign over all of the Lord's creation. Man was to have dominion all over all of the creation of God and was to replenish or fill the earth with the race made after the kind of Adam. What was their kind? God is a spirit and they must worship him in spirit and in truth. So this has to be reviewed for those of you that have been following this study. You are a spirit. You have a soul, which is your mind, will, emotions, intellect, and you live in an earth suit. You don't have a spirit, you are a spirit. And in Psalms 24, verse 1, it says, and this is a Psalm of David, 
It says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So man was given rule and reign over the earth which belongs to God. So man in an essence is um, representing um, God here in the earth realm. And he's, this is before anything happens. We're talking about the beginning now. So this man was like the viceroy, the representative of God here in the earth realm. Because this man was made in the image and likeness of God. He was made in the obedience of God. When did this occur? In the beginning, God created all things and for his pleasure. Whose pleasure? For God's pleasure. They were and are created in his image and after his likeness, speaking of the man. Did God create man? Man is his own ma man is not. I need to I need to um, really emphasize these things. Man is not his own maker. Therefore he must not be his own master. We see then uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 and 17 that it was made clear to man because God gave him um, some things that he wanted done and then he gave him the man the outcome of what obedience would be and the outcome of what disobedience would be. In De Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 14 it says, Behold, the heaven and the heavens of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. So God owns everything and man was to be the representative here in the earth realm. God is in heaven, man was given, earth was created for man to have um, rule and reign over but he was to follow the precepts of uh, God. And the good thing about it was he gave man a choice. When he told him in um, Genesis 2.17, of every tree you may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. That gave man a choice. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, he says, I've set before you blessing and cursings, good and evil, therefore choose the blessings. So man had a choice, but with choice comes a responsibility and with choice, when you give somebody a choice, then they have the ability, the will to possibly not do what it is that you are um, commanding them to do. And since God is not a dictator, God is good, he gave man a choice. He's not going to violate your will. He's not going to coerce you, tim intimidate you, or dominate you. A hand is not going to come out of cyberspace and smack us when we're doing something that goes against what God um, has commanded. The consequences of disobedience is what um, we receive. God has told us to choose good, to choose the blessings. And the reverse side of that is if we don't choose the good and if you don't choose the blessing, the evil and the curse is automatic. The author of his being directed man to eat of all the trees in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man was not to eat or he would surely die. Death came as a result of disobedience, not because it was a prophetic word. If you do this, this, this is the outcome, this is what's going to happen. It is God's prerogative to command because he's God, he owns everything. God is to be the director of man's motions and he is to be the center of them. He is to be, but you and I have the will to say, to exercise, I don't want you to be the will, I want to do my own thing, I'll do it my own way. Knowing that there are some consequences that we will receive as a result of obey and a result of disobedience. The righteousness of God requires perfect obedience to all the law of God. The law consisted in perfectly doing all that the law required. Righteousness is God's way of doing and being right. It is a standard. The whole system of the earth is based on legal, um, legalistic things, degrees. Justice is flat. It doesn't curve. It doesn't change. God is absolute in all of his promises, all of his uh, commands, all of his blessings, everything. They're absolute. And so God, the scripture tells us, is the only one that is good here in the earth realm. And so 
and God is love. He loves us. There's nothing you and I can do to make God love us less, and there's nothing you and I can do to make God love us more. God is love. Love, as far as God is concerned, is a decision. He has decided to love us, and when the ones that he loves um, do not obey or are engaging in some activity that God knows is not prosperous for them, he will then send his word to correct them. He will send, he will let them know of his being, of what he is, that he is love, that he's consistent, that he doesn't change, that he's not a respecter of persons, that he is good, he's good to everyone all the time, that he is right. Everything he says is right, everything he does is good. But you and I do not want to know this just intellectually, we want to know this from the depths of our heart, and we want to re establish a relationship with him so that we can then know that he is good based on our experience, our relationship with him, our communing with him. And the way that we commune with God is how? Right. We know that it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It is his goodness. It is the knowledge, the belief, the faith that he is good. So the author of his being directed man not to eat of the tree. He has every right to um, give that command because the tree was his, all the trees were his. We were the stewards over everything that God had created. We were simply the stewards. So as I said before, man was given a choice. He was a granted liberty. That means freedom. And unfortunately, Adam did eat as a result of um, being persuaded by his wife who was um, uh, told by the serpent who was not her friend, that they would not die. Because the Lord told them, if you eat of the tree, of the knowledge, of good and evil, you will surely die. A prophetic word. If you don't eat your vegetables, you will not get any dessert. This is just something that a father or a mother can say to their child, and Adam was a child of God, who was his father. His father was perfect, his father was good. So Adam did eat, and um, one of the principles that I saw in scripture was, I think this was taken from a commentary, it says, deviations from the strict letter of the law of God are nothing more than the free and earnest expression of the will of the transgressor. So the, the man had a free will, Jesus had a free will. Father, let this cup pass from, from me, but your will, not mine, be done. So what God wants is for us to submit our will to his will because he is God and because he's good and because he's not a respecter of persons and he wants us to prosper in every area of our life. Spiritual, and Adam did die as a result of that. Remember we said Adam was a spirit, he has a soul, he lives in an earth suit. Adam died spiritually and um, spiritual death is the penalty for transgression or disobedience. The deed was the procuring cause or the reason why we are subjected to temporal death as a result of Adam disobeying God and dying spiritually. Everyone that was in the loins of Adam was made in his image and in his likeness. Adam was no longer a spirit. He was now spiritually dead. He was a man but not in the image and likeness of God. As a result of Adam's disobedience, the first part of death for mankind that he represented was and is exclusion from the tree of life. And we see in the third chapter of Genesis that um, in the midst of the garden, not only was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life. And so now this man that had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, who had died, could no longer have access to the tree of life because had he eaten the tree of life, this man that was spiritually dead and was dying, perishing, would be in that state eternally because the tree of life, that life is eternal life. So the disobedience was of Adam was the procuring cause or the reason why we are subjected to temporal death. There's three deaths. There is spiritual death. We're all born spiritually dead. 
Then there's physical death. That death is temporal, it's temporary. We're gonna, everyone is going to be raised again with the return of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And then there's eternal death. Eternal death is being eternally separated from God. And it is eternal. It is, lo it is as long as eternal life is eternal death. In Romans chapter 5 verse 12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So death passed upon who? All men. There is a, um, a principle in the Word of God that says everything reproduces after its own kind, which means chickens produce chickens, mice produce mice, man produce man. So um, just as a further explanation of death, physical and spiritual death is temporal. Spiritual death does not mean annihilation. That, that is the act of reducing to nothing. Uh, annihilation means the act of reducing to nothing or non-existence or the state of being reduced to nothing. Spiritual death is not annihilation of the spiritual essence. The spirit is never destroyed. Everyone within the sound of my voice is going to, is not going to cease to exist. You and I will exist somewhere eternally, forever and ever and ever and ever. 1 Corinthians 15:50. Now I say this, my brothers, that it is not possible for flesh and blood to have a part in the kingdom of God, and death may not have a part in life. See, I am giving you the revelation of, of a secret. We will not all come to sleep of death, but we will all be changed. You will exist forever either in the presence of God or no longer in his presence or remembrance. So everyone is going to exist forever somewhere, as I said before. And everyone will be appear either before the judgment seat of Christ or the white throne judgment. The first man, Adam, was created a righteous being who communed with the Creator each day in the cool of the evening after his spiritual death. And what caused his spiritual death? Disobedience, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam was no longer righteous. That means he had no longer, um, he was no longer a spirit made in the image and likeness of God. He was now a soul living in a body. And remember, we said God is a spirit. Man was a spirit initially created in the image and likeness of, of God. But when he um, rebelled and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he surely died spiritually. He was still animated, and he did not start to die until after he ate of the tree of the no af until after he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So how was this Adam to obtain the gift of eternal life for all of mankind? We were all in Adam, so everybody was, was made in the image and likeness of Adam. We were all born spiritually dead. We were all born in sin. After the fall of Adam, no one had the ability to propagate a species in the image and likeness of God because in the earth realm, there were none. Adam was the father of all of the uh, man in the planet, the first man, was now no longer man in the image and likeness of God. And so what he um, produced from his loins was now a thing in his image and his likeness. And I refer you to 1 Corinthians 15, 47, and it talks about the first man is of the earth, the second man is the Lord. The first man is Adam. The second man is Jesus Christ. The question is, there was a, uh, several thousands of years between the first man, Adam, and the birth of uh, Jesus Christ. So what were those things in between the first man, Adam, and Jesus? Because it gives you who begot what, and they begot that, and they begot that. So all of those beings um, were loved of God, but they were not in the image and likeness of God because they were all spiritually dead. 
in 1 Peter 2, verse 10, it says, When in time past, and you have to read this in context, when in time past you were not a pe people. So we have a, a conundrum here in that there are no more, after the fall of Adam, there were no more people in the image and likeness of God. They were man, but they were not of the mankind created by God. So now what we want to do is to find a method and a system of being recreated in the image and likeness of God so that we can then fellowship with the God of all creation. So hopefully I have cleared up some of the things that may have, uh, you have th uh, questions you may have brought up. And I want to encourage you to read the scriptures in full context so that you, as a future teacher, will have a thorough understanding of what happened in the beginning, and then we'll learn how to apply what we've learned in Jesus' name. Amen.